Hey, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's session for Oxford's Humanitas um, Chair in Opera. Um, I want to acknowledge the inspiration of Lord Weidenfeld for setting up these Humanitas Chairs and also the contribution of the Claude Duffield Foundation in supporting it. And on behalf of the Warden and Scholars of New College and the Institute for Strategic Dialogue, I just want to welcome you here this afternoon for the, to these two conversations and our round table. Gérard Mortier needs no introduction from me now. Um, those of you who were here on Thursday heard his masterly ex uh, exposition of the idea of a music festival and enjoyed the reminiscences of his time in Salzburg. I did say to him that the comment that would stay with me was his remark that his innovations were considered suspect because they resulted in fewer private jets arriving at the airport. <laughs> We'll be returning to Salzburg in our first session where he will be interrogated by Adeline M uh, Mueller um, Adeline is the Western Junior Research Fellow at New College and a, Mozart, uh, and a considerable Mozart scholar. Um, she is currently deep in a book project entitled Mozart and the Marketing of Childhood, which will examine the modern ideas of the child as mediated in Mozart's early career and his compositions for the young. She recently edited a double issue of the Opera Quarterly on adaptations of and sequels to Mozart's Desalberflotte, and she has an article out in the Journal of 18th Century Music on 18th Century Child Acting Troops, which for purely practical reasons sounds to me like a total nightmare. When we get to the round table, um, Gerard will be joined by um, Ash Kandekar, the editor of Opera News, and Hugo Shirley, who has worked and written for Opera Magazine. Ash's editorial was not pronoun or unmissable. I used my off-quoted favourite, which starts, After Channel 4's opportunity and ITV's pop star opera star, the BBC joins the love in, in reality TV between TV and opera, with its new series of Maestro, screened in one three-hour episodes on BBC Two at the end of April. Later, he poses the question, There are already rumblings and about dumbing down, but does this type of television really debase or merely demystify opera? And I hope we're going to hear more about that um, in relation to new opera in the next hour or so. Hugo studied at King's College in London with a break in, as a translator in Vienna and took his doctorate with a thesis on Strauss's De Frau Erna Schatten. In a world outside academia, he is a regular contributor to the Opera Magazine and the Daily Telegraph and publishes further reviews and reflections on his blog, Fatal Conclusions. He recently commented, It is remarkable how the word elite can exist in a state of grace when it comes to sport. And while it is weighed down with all manner of self-flagellating guilt and shame when it is applied to opera or classical music, he thereby encapsulates part of a much wider debate on cultural standards. As you recall, we didn't have questions after the inaugural lecture. You should, however, feel free to put them at an appropriate moment um, uh, during this afternoon. When we get to the end of the first session, there will be tea in the foyer, and I hope you'll all join us there for a drink after the last session. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, maybe I would like to start uh, why we chose this title, Mozart or Contemporary. Of course, the title, I stole it from the famous book of Jan Cotton Shakespeare, you know, published uh, already 50 years ago, where he told for the first time Shakespeare or Contemporary. And I think that's the same for Mozart. When we talked with Michael, what should be the themes of uh, the conferences, I thought Mozart is so important uh, because for every opera director, Mozart is the central. When you do theatre, you cannot go around Shakespeare, and when you do opera, you cannot go around Mozart. That doesn't mean that in theatre the Greek tragedy is not as important, but it's really the central when we have to think about our time and to think how we do opera. Uh, Mozart tells about everything. So that was the reason. And at the same time, the second reason was that I believe that the picture of Mozart is still very wrong. Um, it, I don't know the reasons for that, but I think it goes together with uh, rom the romanticism on one side, partly with the famous film of Milos Forman on Amadeus, uh, what was probably very important to bring people to Mozart, but it was such a wrong picture uh, of Mozart. And, um, I believe that still this uh, wrong opinion, we have talked about it together, exists. And I would like to show you a picture um, I put on uh, the Paris Opera 
in 2006, you know, in 2006 was uh, uh, a birthday of Mozart, 200 years uh, after of his birth. And I put this uh, picture on the Palais Garnier. The first thing what happened was that I got a lot of letters telling who is this idiot you put as his picture on the Palais Garnier. Um, you know, this, uh, there is still a lot of discussions about if this picture is really Mozart. Um, but we know, and I decided it is Mozart with some other stage actors, but we know, for example, that the picture was painted when Mozart, at the end of his life in 1790, came back from his uh, travel to Frankfurt and Mainz. You know, he followed the Emperor Leopold II for his coronation to Frankfurt. He was not invited. It was Salieri, once more, who was invited. And we know also that Mozart sold his silver uh, work to, uh, to uh, finance his, uh, his trip to Frankfurt and most important was then that he discovered in Mainz through the concertmaster of the orchestra, very young, 21 years old, Daniel and his brother, that, mo that he was played enormously in Mainz. But go back to this uh, painting, it was painted in Munich and it's in the uh, National Gallery of Berlin. But of course the people, when they think of Mozart, they look to the other picture it's always this. And that's for them the real Mozart. Now you have to know that this painting was done 20 years after his death. And it was painted on base of some documents what the sister of Mozart who wanted a painting of him has given. And so they painted. We know of course that he liked very beautiful robes, that he liked this very red uh, color uh, Mozart. But if I may go back to the other one, to the first one, and we go to the opening, if you have doubt that it would not be Mozart, look to his here, it's exactly the same as the other painting. And we see also, we know, for example, that his left and, and right eye was not completely the same. And what I like on this painting is the power of the eyes. It's also about his character, that he was a man a charming in a certain way, with a very um, lovely face, but not special, not special uh, beautiful. And this absolutely, um, I think he knew what he wanted, that I like. At the same time, you feel it's one year about his death. It was painted about in November, even less, it was 10 months. And you feel already uh, in the, the face is a little bit uh, uh, Decker, you know, had a lot of problems with the kidneys. So you, I, I like very much this painting and uh, I wanted to take it as a symbol of uh, the lot of wrong opinions we have of Mozart. So as a way of introduction to the questions uh, uh, what Mrs. Miller would like to ask me, uh, I would like to fix together with you some important um, points, opinions, who are my opinions but probably, but who are represented by some writers uh, and biographies who uh, appeared the last 15 years. It was very important that, for my feeling, a lot of biographies like the one, uh, the Austrian one, Schenk, I would not uh, consider to the students that you have to read the famous uh, Schenk book, it's always, he's telling always about the aristocrats, Mozart knew with all the details. The most important for me the last 10 years is the one of Maynard Solomon, uh, who appeared, was in New York, and uh, who wrote also Marvelous on Beethoven. Then a book what is not known and very special, not a book what was not sold in Salzburg when I was there, it's the book of Kepler, what, because he was from the DDR. He was also a communist <laughs> for the Salzburg one. It's a great book because he published it when, it was, when he was 19 years old and he worked his whole life on Mozart, what I really <coughs> consider as one of the best. Then a small book of the famous writer, you know, who wrote a book on history of the civilization, development of civil process of civilization of Norbert Elias, who wrote this marvelous small book on uh, Mozart, not completely finished, but with all his written are published. And I would say this gives a new, and you told me also, maybe you can tell then later about the book you, about rhythmic process in Mozart, and, and yourself are writing, I think, a very interesting book.
So that's to say the, um, where I take, uh, I tried to study um, uh, Mozart to perform. But it was typical that these books, if you would walk now in Salzburg, you will not find this, uh, Maynard Solomon maybe, but Kepler you will still not find in Salzburg. And uh, the on, only one, what I think is very good, is the one of Einstein, um, he, who is maybe one of the best. The Wolfgang Schilder's famous book, for example, I uh, would say what is telling a lot about the love stories and his very, uh, yeah, his very vulgar way of writing many times <laughs> on love. I think this is exaggerated, not exaggerated, but it, it puts in a, in a wrong light because it was 18th century. We had, didn't have the Victorian period, so it was a completely uh, other, other time. What are the most important things uh, before our discussions, what I would like to remember? Let's have a look to the, to the travelings of Mozart. What is important for me in the first is that Mozart lived 35, 36 years, so that's about 13,000 days. He traveled through his life about 4,000 days. He was traveling through Europe. It means one third of his life is traveling. And you must know uh, when you see where he traveled to from London to Naples, knowing uh, that in that days you could travel maximum about two and a half, uh, no, about 15 miles, yeah, about 15 miles, 25, 15 miles a day. That was the most you could do uh, with a post co co coach. You, you say in English, the post uh, yeah, coach? Yeah, post coach. Yeah, mm -hmm. post coach. Yeah. Um, Knowing how was the hotels where he had to sleep, horrible, uh, many times. Goethe, for example, on his famous travel to Italy, he always traveled with his own bed uh, because he knew that he shouldn't sleep in the beds of the hotels. So you must believe how Mozart traveled through whole, through whole, uh, whole Europe uh, for one third of his life. And I would like to talk a little bit about his most important travels. Um, I, ma I make them in, in, uh, in red. The first one is this famous travel that he made as a child, what was about three years. You must believe that Mozart, his mother, his father and his sister went through whole Europe for about three years, so they changed. And this was a famous traveling as a wonder child, a child prodig, you say in English. The child prodig, it's very important because later, when Mozart will go back to Paris, they will not recognize. It was really the moment where Mozart was considered mo much more as a circus artist as, as really an artist. You know, he had to play on the piano and his father, father covered the piano so he could improvise. Uh, this journey it says a lot about Mozart um, why it was so difficult later for him to, to uh, convince, uh, for example, d'Alembert, the famous encyclopedist, when he went <coughs> and on his travel to Paris. The three uh, travels to Italy, the most important is the first one, because in this traveling between 69 and 71, this was a travel of about two years, but when Mozart left, uh, he was a child. And when he came back, he was an adolescent. We know that he lost his voice. He was voice mutated when he was in Naples. And all the same time, it's so important because he was alone with his father. And this traveled two years with his father, sleeping every day in the same room, explained so much about this enormous intimate and intense relationship with his father and will explain why he had to go away from his father at a certain moment when he went to Vienna. It was not only to go away from uh, the Colorado uh, Archbishop, but it was also Oedipus who had to kill his father in a certain way. This travel is very important also because he met all great uh, personalities of 
of the, uh, the world of music. He, uh, the greatest composer of um, Martini of Contrapoint in Italy, he was accepted by the Pope, he got the, the Orden of the Pope, he got this famous painting. So you must believe a boy who left uh, at the end of his 12, 13 years until the beginning of 15, who met all the greatest uh, people of his time, intellectuals, uh, in, ho in, in Italy, that it was so important and will explain a lot on his psychology later uh, when we have to study that. The next much important uh, is the famous one to Paris. He was uh, you know, 77, he was uh, 21 years old, he left when he was uh, uh, 21 and he came back then uh, about one and a half year later. It was the first time that he went alone with his mother because his father didn't get um, the permission of the archbishop at that moment. And uh, Mozart writes in a famous letter what I like very much, uh, the, uh, his quote, Jetzt bin ich der Papa. Now I am the father, he said. So that to tell also, to make him free of, of his father, he went alone with his mother. But he had this very horrible uh, situation that his mother died during uh, this traveling. What always his father will say that it was his fault that he didn't take care of his mother. What was not the truth, Mo Mozart suffered very much about this. But that is the first point. So it didn't uh, arrange the relationship between the father and the son at that moment. The second point was that Mozart discovered that his first traveling, where everybody wanted to see him, where he went to Versailles, where he was very upset that Madame Pompadour didn't kiss him, you know, that's all in the letters, it's the best you can read about it, what says a lot about his personality. But that now he discovered that d'Alembert, the famous encyclopedist, that d'Alembert, where he lived, he lived in his home, who lived together with Madame d'Epinay, uh, the other famous woman in, in Paris at that moment, didn't like at all. He told to the father, he wrote a letter to the father, that Mozart was not prepared to accept the society in Paris, that he didn't behave as he should have behaved. That's interesting to know because Alembert, of course, knew very well Rousseau, and Rousseau, uh, was the one who came also from lower family, but we know that the theory of Rousseau would never have been introduced in the Paris society if Rousseau would not have had this style of the Paris society. Mozart couldn't accept. He didn't want to make anti chambre when he had to wait one hour. What was normal to be accepted, he left. And, uh, you know, the, uh, he wrote very few things in Paris at the moment. It's uh, very strange and you will uh, write about it or if you taught me about it. He wrote this famous ballet, not famous, Le Petit Rien. The title says a lot about the ballet uh, in a choreography of Novaire. On the, on the poster, even the name of Mozart was not indicated. And then he, uh, he wrote his famous uh, symphony, Paris symphony, with the famous timpani in the last movement, where we know that he wrote it explicitly that the Paris public always slept in the last moment. So he made with the timpani that it was really composed for that. The famous recital he has given in the house of Conti was a quite disaster because he didn't accept that the people was walking. So this uh, was very important, this traveling, for feeling that he was not anymore the um, the, uh, the prodigy child, and to find out also that his problem would be that at the one side, I will come back on that, that he wrote uh, in a style what this aristocratic public liked enormously, but that from his behavior, he got, could not adapt himself like Goethe would have done marvelously. That was the difference of Mozart. He was a really uh, bourgeois who couldn't accept the style of, um, of the people. There is one more point on this traveling. It was on this traveling that he had his first official um, um, uh, love relation with his uh, cousin, uh, de Basel, in, in, uh, in Augsburg, but more important that he f also uh, met with the Familia Weber. 
uh, and you know he will marry finally Constanza Weber. He loved Aloysia Weber, the great singer, but he couldn't get her, so he ma married later the younger sister, Constanze. But more important that he met Mannheim. And Mannheim what, uh, was at that moment the great place of the symphony, of the development of the sonata form and the symphony. I tell this because if you would have to characterize the style of Mozart, what is so fantastic in his operas, and it's one of the few, that he combines the greatest bel canto style he learned on his first traveling to uh, Milan and the next one when he composed uh, Lucio Silla and uh, also uh, the Ascano in Alba and he combined it with the style of the symphony and the, uh, the development in Mannheim. Why? Because um, one century before, all the best musicians who was, uh, went away from the aristocratic families in um, Prague, in Czechoslovakia, with the war with the Habsburg, and they all went to the famous uh, court in Mannheim, and the same man who was at that time in Mannheim came then later uh, to, to Munich. Um, so that's the first time where Mozart will start to combine, and you will hear it in his, then as soon uh, already in Idomeneo, what he composed after his Paris travel, that he combines this. And it was a completely renovation in opera. You had all the great bel canto style, and of course, uh, we have just thought with Purcell and, and with Monteverdi was something different, but in this classical form, this combination of these two. So this traveling is very important. And then the last, uh, what I would like to say before I go to Vienna, so that we, we have to keep our half an hour, <laughs> we, we, we get it. Um, I would like the Prague journey, of course, where he uh, did his Notes at the Figaro, who was premiered in Vienna, and then, of course, the, the Don Giovanni. But I would like to talk also, because it's already a little bit too early, but I want to say now, there's this famous journey to Berlin, you know, in 89. This is very important when you see what was the situation at the end of the life of Mozart. This journey of Berlin, where he only get an order of uh, the king of Prussia to compose these six uh, quartets and he only composed three and some sonatas for his daughter. Now the new uh, knowledge about Mozart indicates that that was the moment uh, where he goes, he composed enormously because afterwards in the two years he will compose Così uh, fan tutte, Magic Flute, Clemenza di Tito, the, mo the last, the Jupiter Symphony, enormous, the Clarinet and Concerto, so the great, great works. And at the same time, uh, this voyage was to flee for the first time uh, from Constanze, because it was the first time that he felt this marriage goes to an end, and we know that he did it with his famous singer of uh, Donna Anna, what was the wife of one of his friends, Madame Ducek, who sang his Susanna in Prague and also Donna Anna. They met each other and they went together to Dresden. So it was certainly a moment where Mozart, who has a great friendship to her, wanted to talk with this woman about his private life and also about his uh, situation in Vienna, what at that moment was already uh, quite bad. And now a lot of people even say that the king of Prussia didn't give this order because we have a famous letter what he writes to his wife to say, uh, and the king is waiting for me. <laughs> and we know that the king even didn't accept him. He was sent to the secretary when he arrived in Berlin. So this, it's very interesting to understand what happened in the last years of Mozart. So that's about uh, what we can learn about the travels of Mozart. Uh, and of course, it's enormous. It, it explains a lot about his genie, uh, 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 this genius. And I would like to uh, finish uh, to tell uh, something about his Viennese period. So if you look to the life of Mozart, the first uh, part is dedicated to the traveling and the last part, the last 10 years, there's also Martin's book on this, he's living in Vienna. 
This Vienna, we have first of all to uh, analyze, because my problem with Mozart is that you cannot understand Mozart, and you will confirm this certainly, out of the social and political context he lived in. That was the context of the French Revolution, that was the context of Joseph II in Vienna. And uh, Vienna from Joseph II was an enormous evolution. You know, at the same time that Joseph did all the reforms, and these reforms was very important. We have a little bit, many times, forgotten about it. First of all, the index, for example, of the books, who could be, uh, was a uh, 5,000 books was on the index when he arrived as emperor. At the end, there was only 600 books on the index. Uh, there was the abolition of death penalty. There was abolition of torture. There was abolition of slavery in Vienna. At the same time, he was very austere. He, they called him the, the sacristian uh, man, but he was very open. He accepted the Frank masonry. Uh, most of his collaborators, Van Zwieten, Zonfels, was all a part of this Frank masonry. So this Vienna was really an enormous development. At the same time, his sister was uh, Marie Antoinette, was married to Louis XVI. And when you compare what happens in Paris and what happens in Vienna, you see that Joseph II was really an innovator. And it's for me always interesting to read that Voltaire wrote when he was in Berlin with the King of Prussia, uh, Joseph II is one of ours. So it means that uh, he represented for the Enlightenment at that time really a great uh, innovation. So uh, Mozart arrived in that time in Vienna. He went to Vienna after his premiere of Idomeneo in Munich because uh, he couldn't stand out anymore the provincialism of the court in Salzburg, the behavior of Mr. Colorado, who is always negative, but he was finally, uh, he had some very interesting, he was m economically much better as uh, the f uh, his man before Schappenbach. But, um, so we have to look at it more clearly in this painting, but he couldn't stand anymore. And of course, as we may know, the greatest envy of Mozart was composing operas. Uh, and that may be where he's the most modern. When you analyze his music, you will see that he goes the far, the most far in his opera music. In Salzburg, he would never could compose really great operas. There was not the money to do that. So he had to go away from Salzburg. One, because he could stand out the court. Secondly, he had felt that he had to separate of his father to go further in his uh, development. And he take the risk. And I will finish uh, with that, what this risk meant. Um, uh, it was the first time that a composer decided, and I don't know if Mozart was very conscious about that, that he decided to be on his own without an employment of an aristocrat or of the church. He looked the whole time of, for the employment, but he went to Vienna without the security. And what we see is that when he arrives in Vienna, he marries uh, Constance against the will of his father, who himself married the, uh, Anna, the mother of Mal, Mal against, against the will of his family. He marries Constance, re, read, uh, writes the Semol Mass, and will then write the abduction of the Seraglio. And I would say, when you listen to the quartet who finished the, the first part, when you listen to that, you feel this young man full of dynamic. He will conquer the world. It's, uh, this music is really uh, the young dynamism of Mozart arriving in Vienna. What you feel also in the famous Exultate in the C minor mass. But what is very interesting too, that the C, C minor mass, he never finished it. And the abduction of the Seraglio was the only opera really he wrote uh, on command of Joseph II. Then Mozart was very clever in Vienna. He started to 
have a great contact with all the aristocrats there. He, man, he uh, had the encounter, the famous encounter with Lorenzo da Ponte, with uh, the famous banker Plankenstein. And then he first of all composed piano concertos. That was his, he made a lot of piano lessons, did his piano concert. So we see the first part in Vienna, he really makes a lot of money and he makes a lot to conquer. Vienna, because he wanted this. But of course, as he wanted to do opera, he will only compose after the abduction four years later, the Notte de Figaro. And these last five years, you will feel the, the excitement about Mozart fall down completely. And the reasons are very simple. Vienna is a very changing town, and it's the same like now. You know, the piano soloist one day, it's Parogorolic, the other day is Lang Lang, and in two years it will be another one. Uh, you know, that was the same in Mozart's time. So Mozart, when he arrived, uh, then he was a famous virtuoso, very soon Beethoven will be after the death of Mozart, the great virtuoso. And um, so he, the, 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 this mod for Mozart disappeared. The second point was that in contrary what we are thinking, that Mozart looked very carefully to the librettos he would like to write. Before he composed the Notte di Figaro, he wrote about 100 uh, possible librettos. He was not the one that he accepted of Metastasio, uh, the famous writer, uh, a book. He really looked very careful on it. And then he will dedicate himself completely to the opera, but these operas didn't work in, uh, in Vienna. We know that the Notte only was a great success later in Prague, when it was performed for the second time in Prague. The Don Giovanni, what was performed first in uh, uh, Prague and then in Vienna, was not a success at all. It was already in Prague less great success as Notte, and we can understand, because it's completely different of Notte di Fiero. It's one of the most modern operas ever written at that time, and only with magic flute, and that's for me very important, he gets again success, but not in the theatre of the aristocrats, he got it in the theatre of the people, in the theatre of der Wieden, not to compare with Theatre and der Wien, Theatre of der Weiden, who doesn't exist anymore, the Theatre of Schikaneder. And we know also that what he, the only uh, thing he, he got at the end was also the Clemenza di Tito, but that was not a success at all because the wife and uh, uh, Leopold II couldn't accept that Mozart tells in this, and we will talk about it then, so uh, tells in this that the greatest value of an emperor is uh, the Clemenza at the same time that the sister of Leopold II was in prison and will be very, uh, they kept, they lose her head through the French Revolution. So that was very revolutionary of Mozart. But to, fair, to, to conclude, that I, uh, I think it's very important to understand Mozart's music, to see him in this social political context. It means that he's the first artist who really tries to be himself, but at the same time tries to convince a public he cannot live in, in the same way. So he's um, a bourgeois man who is not against classes, always what they say about, you know, about uh, Notre de Figaro, uh, that's not right, it's not a revolutionary piece, it's only a piece where he says, I'm against the privileges of the aristocracy, but I accept that there is an aristocracy that's uh, very different. But at the same time, his, uh, so this political engagement, so he writes for a public where he cannot be the servant. Then we have to combine his creations, also what happens in Vienna, for example, the Notte di Figaro is written some months after the law of the marriage, what was published by Joseph II. We have to know that, because otherwise you couldn't understand why in the first act uh, there is the, the, the témoignage, uh, the, 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 the témoin the, the, who comes, uh, the whole chorus coming in this small room where in the beginning they have to, you know, they are looking uh, 
where to put the, the bed and then in the same room the chorus come in to sing with the car. So it's all very unrealistic. But it was because Mozart wants to show that the marriage was an, ins an institution of the new bourgeoisie and that was against the very um, decadent uh, rules of the aristocracy of his time. The Don Giovanni would be a reaction against that, an analysis of erotism and, and of one of the greatest mythologies about that. And the Cosi Fantuti goes even further, but that we will discuss that. He was at the same time not a poor man at the end of his life. He was a very rich composer at the mid of his life, when he, in 1785, he won 6,000 gulden. And you must know that his father, his salary, in one year was 600 in Salzburg. So he won 10 times more as his father. And we know that then he lost money because his aristocrats, the, the war with Turkey. But we know then that in the last year of his life, he, in contrary what you can read in a lot of books, he paid back. Uh, the debts he had to Mr. Puchberg, not what they say he lost. No, no, he won a lot of money in the last year of his life. And we know even that he was invited to come to London to uh, write two operas and that he started to study uh, English, what is fascinating for me too. He talked, he talked English, uh, not completely, but he studied. He talked perfect French, Italian, German. So he was a European avant la lettre, we can say. And that all these wrong uh, opinions about Mozart is uh, very important to analyze them because otherwise we cannot give the importance to the, the, um, uh, the importance of this music. And the one who liked the piano concertos of Mozart, I would to understand this, what it means musically. Uh, is to compare the two concertos in the F, the, uh, F major. What is really a concert, piano concert, he wrote for his public and some months later he reads a, reads a famous D minor. And the D minor concerto, when you listen to this, this is a concerto of Mozart. That was the style he wanted to write. What he always realized in the operas and what he couldn't do, uh, uh, not always in, in his other music. So I think with this uh, beginning, thoughts about Mozart, about wrong conceptions for my feeling, we are well established to start <laughs> this discussion. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Mortier. It's, um, I, it's, it's such, such a treat to hear you um, give this overview of Mozart's life because I feel in some ways it, it sort of mirrors your own approach to Mozart production throughout your career. And what I mean by that is that um, what, I, what I find you uh, passionately advocating is a return of a sort of a more dangerous Mozart. Mm -hmm. um, so this was this was a, a composer who, as you as you say, he went on this uh, long tour as a child um, when travel like that could actually be life threatening, and and I think all the members of the Mozart family at one point were at death's door on that mm -hmm. on that prodigy tour. Um, uh, so Leopold took an enormous risk, taking his family on the road at such a young age. Um, then Mozart, in his adulthood, you know, makes his way to Vienna without the security of a, of a court <coughs> appointment and is, is basically you know, working for a living, a kind of um, commission to commission, opera to opera, living from, from uh, paycheck to paycheck, as it were. Um, he, he lived a very sort of dangerous life for mm -hmm. his time in terms of... Um, uh, working without the traditional safety nets of, um, of a court appointment or a chapel appointment. Um, and um, I think that very nicely reflects your, your own approach to, to Mozart. I mean, uh, you, ever since your days at La Monet, you've been um, considered you know, one of the, the best um, uh, artistic directors for, uh, for pulling together um, contemporary production that is very historically informed, very much um, uh, uh, takes the libretto and the music as the starting point and, the, and that respects the cultural and historical contexts that gave meaning to these operas in the first place, but that very much also wants to, um, wants to inject or re-inject a bit of that danger into the, into the production and to 
um, to reflect how modern uh, Mozart really is. Um, you know, as you as you point out with uh, the sort of trope of marriage in the operas, it's it's very interesting to see um, how sort of complex uh, mar the marriage relationship is treated in the De Ponte operas and 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 uh, even in Die Zauberflöte, which we think of as sort mm. of this, you know kitty opera almost, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's really quite radical the way that marriage is vaunted as, um, as sort of replacement in a way for aristocratic rule. I mean, um, mm -hmm. Papageno and, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and Pamina actually sing, you know, man and wife, wife and man, high kinan di de Goethe on, they're, they're, as, they're like gods. Mm -hmm. um, and that's actually very sort of um, radical and provocative. So, so uh, it was wonderful to hear you give this uh, introduction to sort of your Mozart, your portrait of Mozart, because I feel in many ways it, um, it, it helps us to understand your own approach to, mm -hmm. to cultivating a more modern take um, and a more sort of risky and complex take on Mozart than, than I think uh, before then had actually um, been allowed to this composer. He'd gotten a little safe, I think, and, um, and, and a little comfy. And so I, I, I very much appreciate uh, some of the productions that you have um, that you have put together that have really uh, made him a more complex figure for all of us. Um, and so I guess the, the first question I wanted to ask um, when I when I first found out that um, that I would be conducting this conversation, I, I thought purely selfishly what what I would most want to ask you right off the bat, and what I'm assuming some in the audience might also like to know, is how you go about planning a season um, at, uh, at an opera house. I mean, for, for singers, you know, the sort of uh, creative unit, as it were, um, for a singer is a role, right, in, in opera. Um, and for a conductor or a director, the, the sort of creative unit um, that, they're, uh, that they're preoccupied with is, is perhaps a production or a single opera. But for an artistic director, um, you can really think of the whole season as a kind of a work or creative unit in and of itself, and mm -hmm. I know you, you, I know that's true for you because when you be when you became the artistic director at the Salzburg Festival, you initiated um, the practice of of giving each season a theme um, that you would then allow the operas to kind of come into conversation with each other in a very interesting way um, around that theme, and that's a practice that I know you've continued at the Teatro Real. So I would just be sort of curious to ask. What is the process of creating those themes, that, that sense of, of operas in dialogue across an entire season? Um, I know there are many um, competing, often, interests that go into putting mm -hmm. a season together. Um, but, but you seem, as I think we all know by now, if we didn't before from following your work, um, that you're incredibly thoughtful about the sort of aesthetic um, that you want to project in, mm -hmm. a given, in a given season. So perhaps you could just take us through mm -hmm. either um, a season at Salzburg or the most cur mm -hmm. current season you're at, at Teatro Real, um, where you've done these two, two new productions of Da Ponte operas, and just talk us through a little bit of how you envisioned that mm -hmm. um, season working. Uh, Rico, it's really for me very important, and I will tell you why. I think a public theater, it's a theatre what is funded by public money. It's not only a theatre uh, for divertissement. It's, uh, it's something where you have to talk something about the society and we are, we are living in. So um, it's for me very important that the programmation of a t public theatre, I would say, uh, it's not like you go to buy something in Harrods where you can find uh, everything mm -hmm. um, or a corte inglés in, uh, in Spain. Um, I don't want either that an opera, what we see more and more, is a little bit like a cemetery where you put a flower on a tomb every year on, on a different tomb. This year it's Verdi Wagner. We forget about Büchner. <laughs> Next what? year it was, uh, was that, it was Messiaen. In most of the opera houses, uh, seems to me, cemeteries. 
And um, our opera houses where Mrs. Netrebko will be present in, uh, and then she sings uh, Maria Suard in the Met, and then you can sing the same. Or we knew that the last two years we could hear everywhere one of the most unimportant operas. I know La Fille du Regiment of Donizetti, once in Covent Garden, once in Met, and in Vienna, then in Paris, all the same with Mrs. Dessay and Mr. Flores. So I think uh, that cannot be the sense of public theatre, who are funded with enormous millions and millions of euros uh, of, of the society. But it doesn't come from me. I, I was always, when in my 20s, uh, I followed very much what was happening in the theatre, and the two theatres who inspired me very much was in Berlin, the Schaubühne, and that time with Peter Stein, it was Peter Brook in Paris, uh, first here in England and in Paris, was Patrice Chéreau and Ariane Nushkin. And that was at the end of the 70s, uh, then started the great public theatres, not in opera, but in the public uh, theatre, in the play theatre, to uh, 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 create projects. For example, the Berlin did a Shakespeare, a great Shakespeare project, uh, who have done Moliere. And when then I get myself opera director, I thought, this is an idea I have to follow. It means I have to create for my public uh, a landscape every season that my public uh, goes with me on a voyage. Uh, on an in, 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 it is an initi uh, initiation voyage for me, the theatre. Every theatre performs is for me an initiation in discovery of the mystery of life, death, passion, uh, love. And um, that, me that was the first thing I have to, but now how to create it. Um, I thought in the first place that for me it's important that some pieces I always do again when I'm somewhere director. I never wanted to stay longer than 10 years, not to fall in routine. And for me, there are, I will tell them, the great pieces I always want to represent because I think that every public I meet again and again, is, uh, could be in Madrid or in Salzburg, is, um, it's of course always Monteverdi, it must be Coronation de Popea. Of course, all the great operas of Mozart, the Da Ponte, the Magic Flute. Uh, then, for me, absolute important, Tristan Meistersinger, rather than the ring. In Verdi, it's for me Traviata, Don Carlo, Falstaff, um, and maybe uh, Macbeth, very important. Then, of course, the 19th century, it's in any case Boris Godunov of Mussorgsky, I put them always. And then it will be one or two pieces of Janacek, Wozzeck, uh, of Alban Burke, of course, and the last years since I discovered the Saint-François of Messiaen. That means in the five, six years I'm somewhere, I will in any case propose these pieces to the public because I think they are central for the understanding. Of course, then it's depending. I, uh, I will do for the first time a personal now. I did already once, I do an Enias. Of course, I will do a handle. Of course, I will do a Gluck. So it doesn't mean that the other works are less important. But I think with these pieces, I can create a central focus where I do wrong. That's the first point. Then a second um, idea in this connection is that some pieces, who are maybe not the greatest artworks, but very good artworks, or the public should know, that you can have another light on it when you combine it with another work. I give one example. The Frown Schatten of um, Strauss is for me a very ornamental piece. It's very interesting, a Hofmann style, but at the same time there's a lot of notes in the score you will never hear in the orchestra pit. That's a great difference, like Adorno said, between Berg and Strauss. Know that Berg, every note you have to hear. Strauss, if you miss, <laughs> doesn't change nothing. Uh, in Frauner Schatten, in any case. But when you compare, when you put, I did it in Paris, the Frauner Schatten, and in the two months after the magic flute of Mozart, you feel where the inspiration of Hofmann's style came from. But you see also the difference between how it was treated in the 18th century and in the beginning of the 20th. For example, the two pairs, the, 
never Mozart would have put the Kaiser and the Kaiserin and Baron Thorin in a quartet. It was for him <laughs> impossible. You have the one, the, the, the famous duet of Papagino Papagina, and then the last uh, duet between both of them. Uh, but Mozart, he, the feeling was so secure of Mozart that he never would have put these two different pairs, the social and the higher pair, together. Uh, because he had this love for Constanze, what was Papagena, and Aloisa was Pamina. And uh, so he would not have put it together. So you learn more about uh, a certain context, at, and I try that my public follows me in, in that case, for example. But that should not be alone literary, not only a theme, it can be also musically and it should be musically. For example, the first time I did Tristan, I did it together with my singer, because I thought it's for the public fantastic to hear at the same time the Tristan, and then one month later, my singer to show the greatness of Wagner um, in uh, the diatonic and, and the style of Wilde of my singer compared uh, to, to, to Tristan. So that's for me very important. Of course, uh, there are other elements. Uh, you should <coughs> not do Tristan and Isolde if you have not an, a Tristan. In any way, there is maybe only one or two, and so it's already very difficult. So I don't know how you can play Wagner this year. I didn't do nothing because there are more, less opera tenors as performers we have at the moment of Wagner. Mm -hmm. Uh, and or in a smaller theatre like in Welsh National Opera, <coughs> they did London, it's easier as in the great theatres where everybody wants also the best. Um, so uh, it should be uh, necessary. I would not do also an opera when I have not the team of conductor and stage director uh, for an idea I have on this opera, because it's true that I have already my ideas, I did already five times Don Giovanni, so always I want to do something, a new aspect of Don Giovanni, and I have to find. And finally, I have problems, and that will be maybe for you a discussion also, um, I have problems with some operas because I don't find a solution how I present these operas in our time. I give one example, I adore the music of Aida, of Verdi, I never did it in my 35 years of career because I don't know how I present a triangle situation, what was typically end of 19th century, also a little bit Verdi, Streponi and Teresa Stolz, and uh, on the one side with Egyptian uh, pyramids. So this is uh, a, a very typical, it's a typical 19th century opera about love, it is a little bit inspired by Tristan, of course, and, and, and this Egyptian color, so I don't find a solution how to do it. Oh. Or, um, for me, very difficult to do Rigoletto in this time. You have pieces who are dated, for my feeling, because they come from a certain social context, like Rigoletto. Um, of course, you can do Victor Hugo, you can, but the man, how you present nowadays Rigoletto on the stage in a time where it's already very delicate to talk about disabled person. So it's, for me, that's also for me very difficult. And then there are composers I don't play, but we will not, that I don't, well, because I don't like it. And uh, many times I have to do it because they would say, oh, you prevent people of knowing. So I have also to document um, but it's true that I will not do a lot of, um, I did just Don Pasquale, that was really an exception in my life because Ricardo Muti wants to conduct it. So you do many times an exception, uh, but that's a little bit the way I try. Mm -hmm. my, answer, my answer is too long. Right? No, 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 <laughs> that, no, this is wonderful. Um, yeah, well I thought maybe, maybe what we could do um, by way of sort of a case study is, is talk a little bit about your first season at the Salzburg Festival because um, when you, when you um, uh, there was a transition period, the 1990 and 1991 seasons, and then when you were finally the um, sort of sole uh, figure um, in 1992, um, you, the, you came with a lot of, uh, um, there, were, there was a huge legacy that you were, um, that you were entering into, as you, as you uh, told us a little bit about on Thursday, um, and you 
uh, sort of came out with guns blazing, as it were. You, you know, you, you uh, programmed uh, an opera, La Finta Giardiniera of Mozart, that had not been performed um, at the Salzburg Festival for something like 30 years. Um, and you, uh, you um, put on this production of La Clemenza di Tito mm -hmm. um, that was very modern um, with uh, Orzel and Karl Ernst Theremann, um, two stage directors that you've worked with um, a lot over the years. And I'd just like to ask you a little bit about that, that Tito because I think uh, Clemenza di Tito in, in, in a way, um, again, is a, is a kind of perfect sort of encapsulation of, of your take on Mozart um, because you know, even though he's working in uh, in this, you know, very sort of uh, traditional, almost starch collar medium of the the opera seria, but by nineteen by seventeen ninety one was was um, uh, in many ways sort of uh, a throwback. Um, Mozart made Tito very modern. Um, he mm. uh, threw out a lot of Metastasio's libretto and and had had. Um, a lot of new situations put in. He put in many more ensembles and duets, and sort of. So it's it's very much a product of the post da Ponte years. And I think your production of it for Salzburg really sort of set the tone for um, a, a whole approach that you would take to Mozart in the years to come at the Salzburg Festival. Um, so I wondered if maybe you wanted to, to yeah. talk a little bit about the production. I could put up the. Shall I put up the, yeah. the images? Yeah, okay, I have a couple of images from. This production, Maybe so I people can, have a frame of reference. As an introduction, say it's true, I, I believe as an opera director, as I say, this public theatre, you have to, uh, we will look into that, yeah. Um, I always looked for an opening production who was not shocking, but who take the attention of the public. No, that's a Don Giovanni, yeah, that's there the one, go. but I would like the other picture. You want it's the other one? The, okay. other, the other one. Yeah. Um, I would like first to say, uh, to, to give the example, in uh, in in when my first opera direction was in Brussels, and I opened with Don Carlo, of course, because I think the most beautiful melody in uh, Don Carlo is the melody of the Flemish. So that was Flemish. <laughs> that was the only reason. Uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> the next one in Zadok was Clemenza. I will tell you uh, after that why. And I opened in the Great Festival House from the House of the Dead of Janáček, because I thought for this public. I wanted to show, and I always remember the sponsor, what was Nestle at the time, he said, Mortier, you are someone, I have to invite my people to come to see from the house of the dead, and I pay 200,000 euros for that. That's really a very big challenge. But finally, they loved it. In Paris, I put on Peleas and Lisanne, because the only city where really Peleas is always mal fait, badly treated is Paris and they always want to play it in the Opera Comique because they say it because it was premiered in the Opera Comique. It was premiered because they didn't want it in the big opera and the poor Debussy has suffered enormously so I did it in the Bastille uh, to show with great symphonic orchestra what is created like a Wagner, you have not to play with uh, ten strings and, uh, uh, and it was an enormous success. That was, that was in uh, Madrid uh, I put on Mahagoni of Courtois because it was never done and in this very rich aristocratic public I wanted first to show uh, the situation because it was the beginning of the crisis in Spain and when there is an opera against capitalism and bankers, uh, pardon <laughs> for the bankers present here, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but the, maybe there are, but no, to put the question on, I put the Mahagoni, became also a success. The Clemenza di Tito and Zaldek what happens with Mozart, if you read the books on Mozart, even very well known, for example, I will tell the names because it's better, uh, the famous book of Kurt Palen, what is very famous in Austria, on Don Giovanni, you can read in this book that finally Don Giovanni is a boring libretto, that the second act is a repeat of the first one. Okay. It's nothing so wrong as to say this about Don Giovanni, and we can talk about it. And Clemenza di Tito, until the beginning of the 90s, when you read in all books, it's always considered as an occasional work of Mozart, okay. what he wrote very quickly, and therefore it would be bad. Now we know by Mozart he always wrote quickly, because he had it in his mind. And the only thing what was maybe not completely at his level is the recitatives. So we worked enormously on the recitatives <coughs> in reducing it and, and with a less ornamental style, if I may say. We uh, changed uh, some positions also of some text. 
And I wanted to show the Salve public, what should be the center of Mozart uh, cultivation, that Clemenza is one of the greatest pieces uh, of Mozart, where, as you said, he worked on Metastasio because Mozart fought against Metastasio many times. He wrote very badly about him in some letters. <laughs> and, uh, and he changed completely the style of the opera seria. Uh, for example, in the opera seria, you had always the trio coming at the end of the first act. You had the very special roots. He changed that completely, but it stays an opera seria. But he will not do the aria, the A, B, A, aria, the, so he will change. And what he did is, first of all, a political drama in his time. It would have been that uh, at the moment uh, that you would have done after 11, se uh, September 11 in New York, you would have taken uh, Bush to the Clemenza di Tito. He wouldn't be chance he would never have gone. But the, if you would have taken him uh, to show uh, that the Clemenza is the uh, highest uh, value you can do. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, he changed musically enormously. Already, you hear very seldom. In the opening night, the famous overture tam pa pa pam pam pam, tram pam pa pam pam pam, with the famous trio, what he always will repeat in all his works at that time. Uh, he writes, for example, a northern point after the first. It means already it was revolutionary, because he made in this confirmation what is a coronation opera, so it should be tam pam pa pam pam pam. Tom, pom, 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 and then it starts. No, he makes a great pause to put the question mark that was so ingenious of him. So this opera from the beginning until the last note is thought of. And I wanted to try uh, to show this. And for the staging, I repeated the production I worked two years on in South, it was my, in Brussels. It was an opening production, and you have seen, uh, maybe we can go oh down yeah. back once. Yeah. Um, in a certain way, you can only understand Clemenza if you compare mm -hmm. it with the great drama of Racine, Jean Racine. It's really like uh, Phaedre uh, or Berenice of Racine. It means it's an analysis with a chirurgical uh, sharp of uh, the psychology uh, of uh, figures. And we put it, therefore, in a white room, not uh, uh, with only Roman symbols like a uh, column, what was already destroyed, so that, and with the costumes uh, between modern and 18th century, so that we could follow the public very importantly, the, the gesture. We repeat it very long mm -hmm. and I repeated it. I did it for the last time. No, it's one of my productions I love the most, 20 years. Mm -hmm. No, I would say it's finished because there's a time in life where you mm -hmm. say, no, it's over. You have to do something mm -hmm. otherwise. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was my proposal. You know that I had a big problem because it, was, it should be done by Riccardo Muti, who uh, I will say why he didn't conduct it. <laughs> oh. Oh no. You see, right. yeah. Publio, this, uh, this tree is uh, it's the moment where Vitellia visits uh, Sesto in the beginning of the sex second act. And Publio, who is really like a police chief, he's uh, like Fouquet uh, with Napoleon. <laughs> um, uh, Fouquet. So we put him in a quiet on the one side, already the beginning of the first empire, what will come very soon with Napoleon, and at the same time with the tail, but the tail who was a little bit on the bottom to make it theatri theatrical. Mm. Because you can, in Mozart, a tail, a 90s, would not have worked. Uh, this was for Muti impossible, a tail with who was at on the bottom. So he came in my office and he said, but I cannot conduct with the tail on the bottom. Uh, <laughs> so he left the production. <laughs> we are friends, he was together one month ago again, and uh, uh, Lord Weinfeld has followed all this, so he knows a lot <laughs> about this. Um, but, to say, but he felt that it was too modern in, in the way. We take away all the Roman things and we try to do a uh, Racinian drama. Uh, what Mozart, of course, was, when he was in Paris, he knew about all these things and he already mm -hmm. has felt because he knew about Gluck when he was in Paris. And of course, Gluck was very <coughs> inspired 
uh, also by, by Racine mm. at that time. Mm. Mm. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so, so we thought we might um, sort of uh, follow a little bit further into the, the years of the Salzburg Festival um, and take on uh, another one of Mozart's operas that, um, that also uh, sort of conveys the, the problems and challenges that come with, um, with making 18th century opera modern. And um, so I thought we might take a look at the, uh, your abduction from the Seraglio and Führung aus dem Saal from 1987. Um, <coughs> I have a, a few images. Um, so, so for this production, um, you, you uh, commissioned the director, uh, Francois Abu Salem, to, uh, to create a staging um, that presented the, the, um, the Turkish characters in a much more positive light. I, mean, I think we all know about um, Abduction from the Seraglio um, set in this, um, this sort of harem. Um, it's frequently very problematic uh, for, for companies to put on, um, especially you know, in the 90s, especially after Said's you know, Orientalism. It's very difficult to sort of know how to negotiate the, um, the often uncomfortable uh, stereotypes. Um, but as we know, again, looking back to the opera itself, you can see that um, even in the, the way that Pasha Salem um, is written, uh, he, actually, um, uh, he actually performs a, a very magnanimous act of clemency at the end of the opera. Um, and he's presented in, in a way in a very sympathetic light. Um, so I'd just like to ask you a little bit about, about this production, your thinking behind it, and what went into um, hiring uh, Francois Salem and, and, and how it worked. And the, uh, the other aspect of this production that I really liked um, was that Salem actually introduced uh, traditional Turkish instruments. He's a pa Palestinian director and he, he a part of uh, creating more of a well-rounded character for Pasha Salem involved um, actually having uh, master musicians from Turkey come and play. So in, in this scene, I'm sorry, we have one, one, one character behind a tree here. That's just because it's a scene that I, I um, found online. But we have a, a nay player over on the, the left hand of the screen, a, a sort of master musician um, of, a, of a traditional um, Turkish flute who, who kind of bathes um, Pasha Salim's uh, dialogue in, in this, this sound world. So I'd just like to ask you a little bit about this production and, and uh, how you felt it, it worked or didn't work. I will tell you, uh, for me, the Entführung, the abduction, is really one of the most difficult pieces. I did it twice, once with uh, um, Hanancourt. And, uh, and uh, what is my problem? Of course, that Mozart wrote it um, in a moment that in Vienna, the Turkery was, of course, um, yeah, something very in mode. Of yeah. course, the Turks was in front of Vienna, but it had lost his um, political character. It was more folklore and as you may know the coffee came in Vienna and all the coffee houses thanks to the Turks. And uh, so for me it's very difficult because Mozart in a certain way was not very conscient and he certainly didn't want to compose a political opera. That uh, must be very clear. Meanwhile, <laughs> we lived uh, 200 years further mm -hmm. with a lot of problems, with one of the biggest problems of our continent at the moment is the relationship with the Middle East. And um, so how will you tell this story nowadays? Because the last area of Osmin is really a very fanatic area. Um, and uh, how you can do it and stay politically correct, it's not. As you said, uh, I met at that time Zaid, we were very good friends, and um, uh, I talked, and he was the one who told me you should try to engage a Palestinian director. He was not a very famous director, he, was, he died meanwhile very young, but um, he, in any case, I told him maybe we can try to find a transposition uh, where we find some very important moments so that the public can understand. So he transposed it in a, a more, uh, we played it outside, he transposed in a situation where you could think, okay, that's a Palestinian, um, uh, more Palestinian connected, and uh, Constance could be Jewish and Belmonte as well, but was nothing, was no a sign of it, but you, you could have 
thought of it. In any case, we want to make something very modern, a very modern Western woman who uh, counts as uh, an Arabian could, pa could happen here in Oxford. Mm -hmm. uh, very simple. So it was not uh, something very political, so a very young, very good looking. Uh, Arabian man and very good uh, consent that they meet. He is very in love with mm. her, but already with Mozart, the promise, we will talk about this in Cosi Fan Tutte, the promise is something very important. So maybe she loves in certain way Selim, but at the same time she promised herself to Belmonte. Mm. And probably her life would be more happy if she would have <coughs> married Selim. That's mm. many mm. times with Mozart too. But she promised herself to, and at the same in Cosi Fan Tutte, she right. promised herself right. to Guglielmo, but of course, Ferrando is a real lover mm -hmm. for Fior de Ligi. <laughs> um, so that was one of the points. Another point was that we had to find a solution for Zelim to show what, he, you must know in the opera, he's not really Turkish, he's, uh, he's a typical renegade, he's mm -hmm. one of mm -hmm. North Africa, when you study it very well for the stage records are here, it's North Africa who even uh, converted, you know, mm -hmm. what happened a lot in Spain. Now that I'm living in Spain, I understand even better mm -hmm. the Cosi Fantu. Now mm -hmm. I could do it again, maybe. And uh, finally, we find for Selim that at the end, the famous Turkish march, he becomes a Zufi mm -hmm. and he will enter in philosophy. And the opera ended what was one of the most beautiful ideas in a Zufi dance, as from the dervishes, mm -hmm. uh, Zelim with two others, one where th the Westerns go away, he goes in philosophy because he's lost his great love mm -hmm. of his life. You have to see it in, um, uh, from Mozart, that he, uh, as a positive, the quartet, as I told you, is very dynamic. Uh, you have to see it also a motor between Aloisia and Constance, mm -hmm. and he calls the wife is Constance, mm -hmm. but at the same time he never forgets about Aloisia. Mm -hmm. So he says in the opera series, when you don't get the love, we have to take it out of your heart. Mm -hmm. And that he said certainly in direction <coughs> of Aloisia. When you know Mozart uh, better, when you read his letters, you can find out. So I thought it was a very uh, political correct, but nevertheless uh, interesting uh, op uh, performance. What I would do now different. Uh, the times have again changed and it's now after, in the Syriac context now, it's even more difficult to do uh, and film. So you haven't revived this this particular production? Only in Salzburg. We did it twice or right. three, uh, three right. times. Yeah. Okay. But you, you would um, I do possibly different. do an abduction for a Teatro Real? I don't know. I yeah. have taught already several times. Yeah. Because it's good, it's not so expensive. You need only five singers <laughs> and an <laughs> actor. And you can yeah, that plays also a role in a small chorus. Uh, so I was thinking already, but mm -hmm. I didn't find a solution now because yeah. Uh, it's really difficult, yeah. uh, but maybe with um, even if I would find a Spanish Arabian, uh, in I go a lot to Toledo, and there I know better, I find out better about the possibility mm. of uh, uh, living together. Toledo okay. is the greatest city where Jewish, mm. Arabian, and Christian live perfectly together. The only rule, and that uh, always fascinates me in, in Toledo is that the one who had the power paid the less tax. So when the Christians had the power, then the Arabians and Jewish paid more tax and otherwise. <laughs> so that was a good rule of Toledo. <laughs> great, great. Um, I thought we could maybe uh, wrap up a little bit by talking about your most recent season at the Teatro Real, where you've staged um, two, da Pont two of the Da Ponte operas, um, Cosi Fan Tutte and, and Don Giovanni. Um, and, uh, uh, both of them are co-productions with other theaters. Um, and I'd just like to ask you again a little bit about, uh, well, the, the politics maybe of staging Mozart outside of Austria. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, you staged Mozart, you know, for 10 years in sort of the, the heart of the Mozart cult or Mozart culture worldwide. Um, and, you know, after that you were at the Ruhr Trianal and then Paris Opera and now, now at the Teatro Royale. What is it like um, uh, putting on a new production of Mozart in a city or a country 
that doesn't have that same sort of claim to ownership of the Mozart legacy mm -hmm. as a place like Salzburg, where there's all this baggage of not just the festival, but you know, it being Mozart's birthplace mm -hmm. and everything. Um, so what, do you have to tread differently? Do you have more freedom to, to try different things out? Do you feel like there are certain things that, that maybe um, either the audience or directors that you work with um, in Madrid, uh, do they have a sort of different perspective? Um, and I know, I know with both of these productions, you've, you, you're not working with, with Spanish directors. The, um, the Don Giovanni is Dmitry Chernyakov and the, um, and the Cosi Fantuti is Michal Haneke. So maybe you could just tell us a little bit about how, mm. how you came to, to commission these two mm. productions and, mm. and uh, shall I put up an image from? Um, Maybe of Cozy. Of yeah. Cozy, yeah. Okay, so here's our Cozy. Oh, we then, we, Wolfgang Schimmel, who knows uh, in the middle of San Alfonso. Yeah. Maybe as I, I can say that the most difficult to do more that is, of course, in Salzburg, because you have the whole weight of the tradition, but not always the right tradition. And the tradition is many times uh, laziness, uh, as mm. Mahler said uh, very often. Uh, the point, the other point is that you don't have to rehearse possibilities in Salzburg that can wonder you, but in Salzburg uh, the Vienna Philharmonic would never do more as two stage orchestra rehearsals and when you do great new project you need six maybe, you know, you need to work. Uh, so that was my, uh, the, I would say the less good Mozart productions in my career I did in Salzburg. I did only a very good Entführung, uh, Don Giovanni with Patrick Chero, Clemenza, an interesting but very brute, uh, not a difficult with Martala. Uh, but that's not, in, but to say, uh, when we look into our opera world nowadays, um, I think it's much better to do Mozart uh, outside, and I find out also in Salzburg that they didn't do very much the younger operas and very beautiful are the Finta Giardiniere and the Lucio Silla, of course. Now, about Da Ponte, as, and I hope that with this I can introduce also some questions, because the greatest questions that we talk with Michael always <coughs> comes up is about the staging, of course. <laughs> That's always <laughs> the most discussion with the public. Um, for me, uh, the, I am still uh, not at the end of my questions, and I will finish my life certainly without have solved the questions. <laughs> it's typical for Mozart. Uh, the, the Ponte operas, first of all, it's all different. They have the same signature, but when, and you have this book you told me, when you analyze the music of Don Giovanni, of uh, Cosi and Nazi, it's very, very different. The same Mozart signature, but completely other. I will say in two words, for example, uh, the Nazi di Figaro is a very aria opera with, of course, the greatest ensemble ever composed, the famous uh, finale of the second act, where you start with this a, a duet and you go to a septet. Unbelievable, the first time in history of opera where you go from duet, tercet, quartet, quintet, septet. Uh, but the aria is very important and every figure has uh, his uh, two arias in different style and so on, or most of the time two arias. Don Giovanni is a very, it's, uh, uh, it's the, 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 the color of the orchestration is so different of the Nazi di Figaro. And the Cosi, I don't know if you thought of it, but in Cosi you have to wait 30 minutes before the, you have the first aria. <laughs> that was never done in that time. It was such a shock for the uh, uh, Viennese public that they waited and waited and first the trio and then a duet and again a trio and finally Fiordeligi sings Comis Collio. Was completely, that was already a revolution uh, in that time, so you could understand why. But the character is also very different. The problem, the greatest problem for me, uh, they are different, I don't know if it's the greatest one. The problem of Nozze de Figaro is that it's really a piece 18th century written by Beaumarchais with an intrigue you can difficult transport. So if they ask me, can you play uh, Mozart in contemporary costumes? I would say yes for Don Giovanni, yes for Cosi Fantuti, not the figure, I don't know. Because it's such a typical 18th century piece that how you tell this when I am with the cravat and with the costume, uh, these uh, letters in the, in the garden with the okay. needle you have to put in it. Yeah. That's such 18th century theatre that 
that I have a problem, and I didn't solve the problem at the moment. I did once in, in Zaldwick, not completely um, uh, with success, let's say. Um, uh, Cosi fan tutte is the most difficult because you have this, first of all, since the sexual revolution of 68, uh, and I, I now this, uh, the changing of sexual partner is, is become so, normal, that it's uh, normal, I don't say that it's maybe normal, but it's so habitual that of course how you <coughs> show cozy, that's the first problem. The second problem is that this idea that these two men take a moustache and another boom and come back and the girls don't recognize them. <laughs> it's difficult to tell this nowadays, I think so for me. And then, so it's full of um, things uh, you say how we will tell it and then there is the other problem that of course uh, what Mozart wanted to say and it was very humanistic that one of the really essences of life is that you can be in love with someone very much and that you can fall in love with another one uh, and that it's moral you have not to condemn this that's first of all human situation. And the only question of Mozart is uh, how we deal with that. Because it was the time where Mozart, it's always connected to his personal life, that Mozart knew that he started to have also uh, other relationships, but he was not very happy about it. He was not very proud of this. Uh, during the time he was a chicanator preparing the uh, but he knew also that Constanze had this relationship with his uh, pupil, the, the famous Suss Meyer, who will uh, finish. And he knew about that and he was very generous about it with Constanze, we have to say. But he knew all these things, so he was living himself in his personal sexual erotic life, the situation of Cosi van Tutte. And he writes it in that moment where, he's in, uh, in, uh, where he went to Berlin, a very bad moment of his life. Now, when we discussed it with Haneke, the first thing we had to find out, what want we to tell to the public? That it's bad, that you change of so No, that we didn't want to tell, uh, where you have more divorces at the moment, as much as uh, 50% of, of uh, couples are divorcing. But what we wanted to tell, and that's very Mozart, that when the women at the end, and uh, Fiordiligi feels sorry for Guillermo, it's because she promised herself to pro and that's the beauty of the piece. Mm -hmm. And that was more that this is how we deal with the promise in, mm -hmm. in, in life. Promise is something very important. It's very important in human relationship, in everything, in contracts, you promise. And you have not to sign a contract. Once you have promised something, you keep your promise. And fear the Ligi, is not sorry because she will love more Ferrando, but she's, she knows she has promised. So that was the first point. The second point we decided, and it worked very beautifully, is that the two know that this is a play. Because the two couples are so in love with each other that they say, nothing can happen to us. We are stronger as the erotism. So that means in this scene, you know that the famous duet where the women normally are alone after the first scene and they sing with the portraits mm -hmm. of their lovers, they are present. Mm -hmm. And we, we take inspiration in the Liaison Dangereuse of La Clos, mm -hmm. where the couple, where Alfonso and Selina, uh, Despina, will try to convert mm -hmm. the two lovers, mm -hmm. prove them that love is not uh, for uh, so that was the yeah. second so that and that made it much more so we have a moment in the opera where the women see that the man will go because very machist they want to show don alfonso they are strong and the women feel ooh, 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 that will go wrong okay. and uh, the fantastic is after that the guillermo um, I can show you, we should show it, has seduced Arabella. Mm. He is completely lost, completely. 
uh, and he starts to drink even uh, he uh, because he's he feels very badly after he seduced the friend of his best friend, we should never forget. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's his best friend and his, right. use, uh, his lover. Yeah. So it, it became not moral, but it became a very profound uh, feeling. Uh, what was much more close for my feeling to Mozart, mm -hmm. what he wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Because at that moment of his life, he was very serious. He was light, as we saw, but you see the great moment mm -hmm. In, in a tomb of later is when both sing Pamina mine, when the Wahrheit and Pamina mine. He says, of course, it's the love between, the love to make children between Pamina and Papageno, but the great love like Tristan and Isolde is also in the magic flute. Mm -hmm. Never think of these both, they have somewhere a sexual, uh, sexual, it's very strange in yeah, the yeah. magic flute. <laughs> so you feel how important this is. And then we had one, one changing uh, uh, to the libretto, that was uh, Don Alfonso and Selina uh, and uh, Despina, where we said, finally, this is a couple. It's, uh, it's, it's already, they was married. She married in a certain way Don Alfonso as a young, beautiful woman, and she, her, lo her life is not happy and this love is out. But the final, uh, the last point was that this boat organizing a great party at their home mm. where people can come uh, in 18th century costumes. It was, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah it's eight, he, you see here, you see that, the, yeah. The yeah. There. Here you see, it was a great party, a little bit inspired by Barry Lyndon, of course, it was, we had 60, uh, channels on the yeah. on, on the uh, and uh, it's so modern clothing, but a, a part of yeah. the uh, uh, costumes of the chorus is in uh, normal and the other. Um, so that made the whole transposition of uh, making all the costumes more plausible yeah. for the for the public. Mm -hmm. I believe it's one of the greatest productions I ever mm -hmm. did in mm -hmm. my life. But we rehearsed two months. We prepared two mm -hmm. years. We rehearsed two months, but these two months, everybody was together. Mm -hmm. That's what I would like to say for opera. The conductor, the stage director, the set designer, the costume designer, we was two months together in the opera rehearsing. Mm -hmm. And now we did uh, 20 performances, 10 in Madrid and now 10 in Brussels. Mm -hmm. And I think Mozart deserves that. <laughs> Mozart deserves the highest uh, in 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 invest uh, investment mm -hmm. uh, to come near mm -hmm. to what he tried to do, and I think we didn't solve all the problems mm. still, mm. but I think it's a marvelous presentation. It will yeah, appear yeah, very yeah. soon on video. Great, uh, great. Okay. And how, how did you and Hanneke um, work together? Because it, I mean, it sounds very much like you also have a very, very strong sense of, of dramaturgy, of staging. Um, did <coughs> w w Michael Hanneke is uh, uh, most famous as a film, film director, Amour, filmmaker. Amour. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm wondering, did he come to you with, with this whole concept kind of fully <laughs> presented, fully intact, or did you develop it together over no, no. a couple of years? Or how no, did it, it was, uh, uh, it was uh, he only makes opera with me, he will not do a lot of opera. So we have done the Don Giovanni, what was very controversial but fantastic at all. Mm -hmm and the cozy, and just maybe we do once in our life, we are the same age, so we will know, I don't know if we will do it, but uh, not the Figaro. Mm -hmm. No, uh, Haneke, he develops completely himself, uh, but he told me about it, mm -hmm. and he asked me, and then he asked me to come to the rehearsals, mm -hmm. with, and I waited, and then he asked, is it clear? Uh, do you see it? What I, and then I tried, so then he changed many times. Mm -hmm. But that depends on the stage director and on the conductor. For me, it's important that the conductor is always together with the stage director. For me, it's impossible that the conductor arrives three weeks after the stage director, what happens in the most opera houses. I don't understand so how it can work, mm -hmm. uh, because when you I see it to the stage directors, you know, we start to work on the recitatives with a, a certain tempo. And then the conductor comes and has another idea, you know, or says, come here, closer, and here, closer, because, you know, when he's there from the beginning, this was very difficult to conduct, mm -hmm. but they, they repeated two months, it was possible. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like I could... What was interesting, oh, yeah, yeah. that uh, Haneke mm -hmm. decided to do his film, Amour, mm -hmm. after we decided to do Cosi, because he wanted to reflect on love mm -hmm. through an older pair, where one is dying 
and it was so beautiful because it was really about uh, love and he wanted to connect both of this. So he just got, got the Oscar for Amour right. when we were rehearsing the cuisine. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. I, I feel like we could go on and on, but I, but I know we do want to break for, for tea and give you, give you a chance to catch your breath before the next round. So May I'll I show only one yes. thing about Don Giovanni? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> yes. Um, do you want me to put It's this already up? too much, but I would yeah, like yeah. to say uh, yes, one yes, word. Yes, yes, yes. So that's of course a Don Giovanni. It was enormous boot, this Don Giovanni. Right. <laughs> um, it, uh, in, in Madrid, they liked Cosi. I think if he didn't have the Oscar, they would have boot too. But as he had his Oscar, it <laughs> uh, was different. It helps, <laughs> yeah. Um, I wanted to, what is the problem of Don Giovanni? And then we finish. But that may be also an introduction to questions. Don Giovanni, first of all, there is no one interpretation. Already Mozart was the sixth opera on Don Giovanni, so already Mozart made his interpretation of a mythology. Mozart, uh, the Don Giovanni is really one of the greatest mythologies together with Faust of the modern uh, <coughs> times. So that's already a problem. And when the interpretation of Don Giovanni in the 19th century was that he's a very elegant man who seduces to some woman, let's say in Spain 1003, what was a, a lot we have to say, avoid, but nevertheless he, he stays always elegant uh, and so on. And then I ask always to the public, but if he is this man who is always seduced, why you send him to the hell? <laughs> if you are fit to find him so sympathetic, keep him. Uh, and you know the famous Champagne aria, the aria of the Champagne. When you read the words of this aria, that has nothing to do with Champagne at all. You know, it's uh, an aria where he says, you go on the street to the parade, bring all the girls into, because he wants to organize an orgy at his home. It's, that's the Champagne aria, but uh, the, with a lot of bubbles. Okay, the, 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 the amount of bubbles is the, this only thing with <laughs> the amount of girls, let us say. Uh, so that's the first point. So we tried, first of all, to a very negative, a very dark, uh, dark uh, impression, and therefore we created a bibliotheque without view on, on the outside, inspired by Sartre, uh, l'enfer c'est les autres. Hell are the other ones. Yeah, because like here yeah. it's really the other ones. It's Don Giovanni, he's hell for the other, and the others are hell for Don Giovanni. With books, nobody reads a book. The only time someone name takes a book is Leporelli to show all the names of the women who are seduced. <laughs> and otherwise the books fall on the head, and the uh, contour is killed by the books, so the books who have no sense anymore, who no one, uh, one reads. And finally, Don Giovanni, typical for our time, as the burnout figure. Oh, yeah, that's, uh, the, the, that's great. The, the you can really see him. So at the end, you will see the end with the contour. It's someone who will imitate the contour, and he is a burned out figure, but what is interesting in this staging that all go out of this hell, of this inferno, yes. and Don Giovanni stays, and you don't know if he's really dead or not, but he stays in this inferno. So it was a very intellectual interpretation, mm -hmm. so, but, uh, but I think uh, it, it worked, it was very specific that the young people adored the production, mm -hmm. it was a big fight all every night between <laughs> uh, the, the, what I adore. I adore if there is a great debate <laughs> yes, in, in, yes. The, in the place. And it was, in any case, uh, that was one of the possibilities. But I did another one with Haneke, where John Giovanni was the typical uh, young banker, <coughs> great cars, uh, fantastic woman, but who wants to, uh, to um, uh, suicide himself mm. before, the, before the Champagne area and who will be finally thrown out of the window of a high building at the end. That's the, mm. the so was boot also very much in Paris, of course, at that time. <laughs> no, it's a cult performance. It's very strange with a newing many times the first year it's boot and then you, when you keep it. But I have to say that I am not, uh, um, I am not in favor of a lot of contemporary staging who have nothing to do with the music. For me, it's always out of the music mm. that I try to, to build up, uh, otherwise for me uh, it doesn't work. Well, that's a, a wonderful segue to the, the 
the, the second half of the afternoon, which we'll all be able to um, be, all be able to enjoy after after a bit of refreshment. Now, and we, I just say, like to say, look forward to many more challenging productions. And I think I think we all know um, after after uh, this conversation that. Uh, we need to really have a season subscription to a Mortier, uh, a Mortier theater in order to truly understand the full sweep of the aesthetic vision. So I would be happy if you. Did. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you very much for an enlightening conversation. I very much appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.